Well, we're back from fall break. How's everybody doing? You're all spread out so nice and neat and tidy across the room. Like one or two chairs spacing in between. Well, proud of you all for organizing yourselves. Everybody have a good break? Yeah? I uh, totally escaped. I went to a undisclosed location near Orlando. Uh, rode some pretty magnificent roller coasters. And things called like the Tower of Terror. Uh, Animal Kingdom now has this really killer ride. It's based on Avatar. Anybody ridden it yet? Just out of curiosity? It's brand new and you know, somewhere over the last year they got it uh, operational. It's the ride you have to wait, you know, like maybe two hours unless you have a fast pass, which we had two for Avatar on two different days. And this is a ride, if you've ever been to Disney and ridden the um, Epcot ride called Soren, this is Soren times 10. I mean, it's like you're on the back of a banshee. You're familiar with the movie Avatar. And you feel it's breathing in between your legs because you're literally sitting on the back of this thing through an avatar. So the avatar is sitting on the back of the banshee, but you're somehow you know, mentally connected to the avatar. That's the beauty of the ride. I mean, it's all part of the narrative, right? But you're, but then you're riding through. And I, I was looking around thinking, I really feel like I'm spinning and turning and diving, like I'm on the back of this prehistoric bird thing. It was unbelievable. I don't know how they do it. They must figure out the perfect balance of tipping with the screen position to give the illusion that you're really you know, your G-forces, you're feeling everything. Kind of like it's, kind of like a cross between the Soarin' Ride, which you feel like you're soaring through on a, uh, on a hang glider, different places, and then the Star Wars Ride, where you feel the acceleration and, and the slowdown, because you're, you're in, a, a, in a spaceship and turning and all of that, so it's, it's pretty amazing. But needless to say, I'm finally back. It took me a while to re-enter, but when you go to Disney, you totally escape. Sometimes we need to do that uh, with our family and everybody. So uh, glad to be back. Um, I'd like to do something a little different. Let's open up our Bibles to Psalm 18. This is one of the Psalms that has the uh, has the you know the the title that gives us the idea that this is from David, King David. And I just want to give you an idea of of how the sometimes how we have to keep track of the theological progressions that earlier authors may have laid down some pretty amazing theology and, and insight into the life of faith and how other later authors, like our prophets, pick up on it and weave it into their message. So I'll just start reading in Psalm 18. We won't read the whole thing, but it seems as if the context for this psalm particularly is King David with his mighty men as he's being or fleeing King Saul, finding refuge in places like caves. And remember the story, King David has his chance to take Saul out, but he doesn't. And um, all the way up to the, to the cliffs, really, literally, is, is the pursuit that happens. And King David is maybe getting some inspiration with his quiet time as he's trying to sort out theologically his experience as he's is literally... You know, his life and the life of his mighty men are hanging precariously on edge. But here's what he says. He sums up in Psalm 18, beginning in verse 29. For by thee, capital T refers to God, I can run up a troop. I can run upon a troop. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of Yahweh is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who girds me with strength and makes my way blameless. Here's our familiar verse. David said it first. He makes my feet like hinds feet. And he sets me upon my high places. He trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze and Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand 
upholds me, and thy gentleness makes me great. Thou dost enlarge my steps under me, and my feet have not slipped. It's interesting, David's focus on the feet. You know, the feet are the navigation equipment that, that we have, of course. We walk, we run, we leap. Uh, but in the context of, of a psalm like this, in the reference to the, the, the goat video that I showed, I'll just show you a little bit, just to, by way of reminder. I'm just always inspired when I see this. Across the globe, Justin goats are the ultimate mountaineers. They can pick their way across near vertical cliffs, find impossible routes up and down rocky crags, daintily tackling terrain that for most animals and for us would be lethal. They face some of the most adverse weather conditions and they inhabit some of the most inaccessible rock faces. These mountain goats really do live their lives on the edge. Here on the Great Orm in North Wales, these Kashmiri mountain goats can make it to places that other grazing animals can't reach, feasting on the lush grass tucked into crevices and crags. They do it with such ease and such confidence, and the fact that there's a massive 50 metre drop into the Irish Sea below just doesn't seem to bother them in the slightest. Right. So that's the, that's the picture that inspired King David, right? And it's the specially designed um, <clears throat> hooves, the hinds feet that he, he refers to in this psalm. Also, 2 Samuel 22 is another psalm that's there in, right in the middle of the historical narrative, 2 Samuel, but it's another psalm that is attributed to King David. And he mentions again the hinds feet. So this is a picture of, it's interesting for David, he's, if he's the, or, the true originator, coming up with this idea, how do we picture the life of faith amidst adversity or faith amidst the storm or when life is caving in on you or you're, when you're having to navigate through literally rocky situations in life? I mean, that's, isn't that our life of faith? We, we can identify with this picture. Maybe uh, some of us need to be encouraged uh, with this picture. Go back and take a look at Psalm 2 Samuel 22 and, and Psalm 18. Dive right into Psalm 19. You'll be really, I, I like to read those together. They're very encouraging when you read them together if you need a little faith encouragement. But it's this picture. And it's going to come up now, tonight, uh, as we see here uh, in Nahum. Uh, and we'll see it again with Habakkuk. Habakkuk, the prophet, we'll see, picks up on this identical picture of the hind's feet for high places. So he's, again, using, and maybe I think rightly so, borrowing from King David and his picture, bringing it into his context, that is the prophet Habakkuk, who has the difficult job of encouraging the righteous remnant, uh, the minority in his case, in Judah, during a time when the political situation is starting to get a little bit rocky for, for Judah. And we'll see that tonight. So I just want to kind of set that stage here for us as we as we look at this picture. So this is an example of intertextuality, the developing theology, those timeless pictures of what this looks like. You know, I've driven, you know, I draw my picture of, you know, this, this picture, you've seen me come back to it time and time again, and what authentic faith looks like. And, you know, I think the authors of the Old Testament would agree that these feet are the specially designed Heinz feet. And as we get into understanding, you know, the prophetic, the prophetic vantage point, he's trying to encourage the authentic faithful uh, in their day with this authentic picture of what faith looks like when the storms come, right? So let's pray, and we'll get started with uh, our lecture tonight. And remind me, I need to make some comments about the midterm and uh, the mi mysterious missing reading quiz for this week. <laughs> so I have a few words to say about that. So let's pray. I want to lift up one of our um, uh, live students tonight, uh, Brenton, who's uh, having a difficult time, speaking of difficult times, with regards to a tra difficult transition with regards to his church leadership. Sometimes those can be rocky times. If any of you have ever experienced figuring out how to navigate a tr church transition, whether it be the head pastor of one to the next, and you're on staff, and I think 
it's got to be difficult to, to know how am I going to fit in with the authority structure of the next guy. Sometimes there's conflict over that, so we'll pray for Brenton. And also I want to pray for uh, one of my uh, church members, Kip, who's going to uh, over to Myanmar Thursday this of this week to teach uh, some of the small church pastors, country pastors in that country. The unusual thing about Kip is he's he's one. If I if you remember me mentioning him last semester uh, or a year ago, actually he lost his wife last year uh, tragically, and you know, nobody knew it was going to happen. It wasn't even anything anybody was anticipating. It's sudden. He's going through grieving, and I'm praying that he uh, the Lord gets a hold of him and helps him reconnect in all the right ways as he's still going through grieving. I don't think you ever get over that when you lose somebody that close. But I pray that him being in that other context in he's over there with the people, God's people in Myanmar and also in Thailand when they cross the border, uh, God will work powerfully, not only through him, but, but in him. Well, any other prayer requests tonight? Jared, I know you need ongoing prayer. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Being a Houston fan and all that, so I don't even know how to pray for that. Speak with uh, Dr. Ross. Okay. He was. Uh, he told us in his class today that uh, he's got that. He's got ongoing recovery from that surgery, right? His wife was going to get test results that we have not heard of yet, but uh, okay. they were either very good news or very bad news. That's how he described it in class. So. Dr. Blazing's in a similar situation with his wife who's going through cancer. Yeah. Right now, so. Wow. That, bring that one up. I didn't know that. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I'll just lead us tonight. Lord, we just pray for your grace and mercy. Uh, we're always dependent on you. Lord, we're encouraged from your word tonight in Psalm 18 and in 2 Samuel 22 and Again, in Habakkuk 3, when we get there tonight, we'll be encouraged to see the picture of faith that you equip us, the, the righteous, uh, faithful, the remnant, Lord, with specially designed feet, the feet of faith that navigate through rocky crags and storms and are always able to find sure foothold when it's uh, the situation around us can be very difficult. Lord, I know a lot of students in this class uh, are part of ongoing relief efforts in places like Houston and uh, Florida where there's rebuilding and also uh, Puerto Rico and places that have been recently hit by hurricanes and uh, the devastation and rebuilding that's always necessary. We pray that you continue to give them and grant them strength, multiply their time and efforts as they're not only helping others around them, but they're also keeping up with this class and other classes as they're pursuing a seminary training, but just continue to bless them, provide for them. Lord, we pray for Brenton and his situation with his church transition, that you bless him, bless his family, um, help him to navigate through with uh, Heinz feet, and, uh, know the direction that he needs to go and, and the steps that he needs to step through, uh, perhaps this rocky situation that he's in right now. For Kip, my brother at church, and uh, pray for this situation as he He's transitioning to Myanmar this week to teach the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy, and that you bless him, but also work in his own life mightily as he's continuing to grieve the loss of his wife, Marilyn, from this last year. Lord, we lift up to you Dr. Ross, particularly, specifically his wife, and the tests that they're getting back even as we speak. Lord, we pray for good test results. We pray for wisdom for the doctors. They look at charts and diagnose her situation. We pray for faith and strength for both of them, that you'd allow them to be salt and light as they as they navigate through their situation, as well as the Blazings, Doctor Doctor Blazing and his wife Diane, as they are awaiting more results back from some of the recent um, biopsy that was taken. Lord, we pray that she would be cancer free. She's been going through chemo for the almost this whole year, different times, and we pray that you just help bring full healing and strength and restoration to her body through this. 
Lord, in all of these things, we recognize our need for you. And, uh, Lord, I pray for these students as they prepare for the midterm this week and other tests as well. Multiply their time and energy, their efforts, Lord. Allow them a clarity of heart and mind as they as they prepare for all of these assignments, Lord. And ask, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we'll pick up and finish uh, Nahum. Let's turn to the book of Nahum, and uh, we'll pick up with the cone of shame. We're ready for... We just started Nahum last, last time, if I recall, before fall break. One of the things that we see in chapter 1, I think we we're kind of down there right around verse 14, um, I'll just read that one. Uh, Nahum, as we know, and just as a way of reminder, is he's prophesying against the Assyrians, and particularly you'll see a lot of reference to the capital city of Nineveh, but for the audience that he has in, in Judah. So it's kind of a, you've got to think of Nahum as kind of a, while he's preaching to you know, judgment and coming destruction against the Assyrians, kind of their downfall, he's got an ear to Judah and his audience in and around Jerusalem. So what they're hearing, while they're hearing prophecies against this, and we'll see tonight, this wayward nation, this bloodthirsty nation that's made a religion out of violence against other nations, God's concerned for that as well, even though they're not his, his direct chosen people. But Judah needs to hear this too, because some of the crimes and offenses in for the Assyrians may be applicable applicable to the southern nation of Judah. They need to have their ears tickled with this message as well. It may be very well that the idolatry and the uh, some of the things that will be uh, the accusations against the Ninevites, the Assyrians may well be applicable to Judah as well. So it's kind of a dual message. So one of the things that Nahum does in chapter 1, verse 14, um, let's see, uh, Tad, could you read that for us? Chapter 1, verse 14. And this is what the Lord says concerning the Assyrians and Nineveh. You will have no more children to carry on your name. Maybe chapter 1, verse 14. I'm sorry. Was that right? In Nahum. Yeah. That's what I got. Really? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead then. And this is what the Lord says concerning the Assyrians and Nineveh: You will have no more children to carry on your name. I will destroy all the idols in the oh. temples of your gods. Okay. Keep going. I am preparing a grave for you because you are despicable. Wow, that's pretty. That's it. Is that the what translation is that? New Living Translation. Oh, the New Living Translation. So it's a little more. Jazzy or pizzazz. There's a little more. Yeah. But you see, that's good, though. I'm not criticizing uh, that one. I think it was spot on. But you see here for the Assyrian king, uh, the Lord is preparing what would have been understood as the ancient Near Eastern version of the Cone of Shame. You know, this movie, the Cone of Shame, I like that picture. Puts it around the dog. See, what's going to happen here is, what's going to happen is, you see the reference there. You're... So concerning you, that is the Assyrian king, verse 14, your name will no longer be perpetuated. So that idea of the name or the reputation of the king will come to an end. Um, his name will turn to shame. And then we see second what the Lord's going to do. I'll cut off idols and images from the house of your gods, little g gods. So not only will he you know, end the name and the reputation of this Assyrian god, now you see... Judgment will come in the form of all images and forms, um, you know, forms of the Assyrian gods in the temple uh, will also come to an end. So your shame will extend to the shaming of your Assyrian gods. And finally, you see a reference to the, I'll prepare your grave for you are contemptible or detestable, that idea. So... You'll have a grave, but it'll be dug for, it'll be an unmarked grave. That's the idea here. 
So it'll be a shameful grave, a grave of no significance whatsoever. Um, so this will mean a military defeat for the Assyrian king. So this is coming out of Nahum's prophecy. But now we see verse 15. Go ahead and keep reading there. Look, a messenger is coming over the mountains with good news. He is bringing a message of peace. Celebrate your festivals, O people of Judah, and fulfill all your vows. Your wicked enemies will never invade your land again. They will be completely destroyed. So this good news is probably coming in the, you know, back then delivered by a messenger. Behold, the feet of those who bring good news. What's the good news? Well, it's the fall of, of Nineveh. It's the fall of the Assyrians. That's the good news. Probably uh, close to the time of the actual fall of Nineveh, which is just around the corner in 612 B.C. So you picture Nahum you know, with his ear to the ground and, and, and his ear to heaven, is hearing from the Lord with regards to the eventual collapse and fall of the Ninevites at the hands of the Babylonians who are going to be fighting there at the fall of Nineveh in 612. So this is, this is the good news. This is a picture of um, the chariots of the, of the Assyrians and battle array and all of that. And what we see in chapter 2 in Nahum is, is one ongoing oracle with some pretty graphic details in chapter 2 of the, of the battle that's going to take place uh, with, re, with regards to the siege of Nineveh. Let's just take a look at some of the high points um, Let's have, uh, let's see, Damien's not here. Trevor, were you here? No, I, Ian, why don't you read for us? We have you missing tonight. Chapter 2, pick up in verse 3 through 5. Shino of his mighty men is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. The chariots come with flashing metal on the day he musters them. Cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and fro through the squares. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The siege tower is set up. Did you get all the way through? Okay. You see just, uh, you know, there's a picture of the battle, right? You, you, you see the shimmering, bright flashes of light, the chaos that ensues, the chariots that are, in, you know, encircling the... The walls, uh, he's painting a picture of the army, the attacking army that's outside of the walled city of Nineveh. Um, the outside army's been routed. Now the chariots are looking for a, a breach in the wall, someplace where they can you know, dive in with their army and attack. So this is, uh, this is the picture that Nahum's building for you know, his oracle against Nineveh, but who's hearing it? It's interesting. It's the... Uh, Judah uh, and those who are in Jerusalem. So double intentions here. On the one hand, you know, Judah would be happy and happy to hear this. This is good news. Nineveh's going to fall. Those brutal bullies from the north are going to have their day. God's, you know, this this battle is going to be fought, and then, you know the Assyrians are going to lose. But the flip side of the coin is for Nineveh. I'm sorry, for Nahum, and soon to be Habakkuk, because they're kind of sister prophets, and we'll get to that in a second. Guess who's coming to fill in their space? Right? The Babylonians. They're going to be the army that comes in and defeats the Syrians, but they're going to be the next bully on the block, and soon to be the bully that invades them. So that's part of the the, the dual-sided coin or nature of this. And you see interesting references in verse 5. I can't remember how yours translated it there. Right at the end of verse 5. My translation in the American says, and the, the mantelet is set up. A mantelet. One of those rare Hebrew words, but basically it's the siege uh, weaponry, kind of the siege covering of some kind of device that would have looked like this. And they had... Things like that in the ancient uh, times during the time when you'd have to get over a wall and figure out how to protect your troops in the process, you're going to have protection against the archers who are going to be standing at the top trying to take out. And you know the picture. So it's really uh, in a lot of details what Nahum is, is describing here. Well, we move on to uh, verses 6 through 10. 
Let's see, I'm going to have uh, Jared, why don't you go ahead and read for us in that same chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Down through verse 10. Down to verse 6. Starting in verse 6 until I tell you to stop or interrupt you rudely. Uh, go ahead. The river gates are open. The palace melts away. Its mistress is stripped. She is carried off. Her slave girls lamenting, moaning like doves and beating their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Halt! Halt! They cry, but none turn back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end to the tre of the treasure or of the wealth of all precious things. Desolate, desolation and ruin. Hearts melt, knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins. All faces grow pale. You can just pause there. Thanks. But yeah, that's the picture. You see this, this, this more detail Nahum gives with regards to the siege that's taken place. And what's interesting about this is... Uh, the early part of verse 8, Nineveh was like a pool of water throughout her days. Well, the picture here, I think what we have to say, the, some kind of flooding that's going on. That's part of the, kind of the downfall or destruction of Nineveh. And what's interesting, um, we have uh, outside of the Bible references to uh, something that may have happened actually in history that parallels and, and substantiates what the Bible is describing here. Um, you have to understand the location of Nineveh was in that Tigris-Euphrates river valley, and they probably had things such as dikes to protect themselves against the floodwaters that would occasionally be part of the Tigris-Euphrates river valley, much like our modern-day New Orleans, maybe not as sophisticated, but nonetheless they'd have to have something now what you do if you're an attacking army is you look for the weakest link in the defenses of a city. And if you've got dikes, if there's some way to take over the dikes and let the water through, you're going to do that. That's the path of least resistance. So the Greek historian uh, Diodorus uh, Siculus, I think I said that right, he, write, he writes about the fall of Nineveh. And he reports that a series of rainfalls swelled the Tigris and flooded a portion of the city, causing a cave -in of about two miles of the city walls. So uh, you might think that the Babylonian army had a little help from Mother Nature, right? But, you know, it's interesting. It's just an interesting non-biblical reference. So a little divine intervention perhaps, heavy rains, Pressure against the dikes, all we have to do is break it, and the rest is history. You've got a broken dike, the water rushes in, and then you have the chaos that ensues in the rest of the plunder, 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 right? You've got full access now to the city. Uh, the army is routed, go in and raid, take the silver, take their gold, for there's no limit to their treasure. That's the Assyrians. So let's go raid the, uh, you know, the treasury of the king. Let's go raid the Assyrian temples and take the gold away. So that's what we have going on. Um, and there's no place, there's no safe place for the lion. Notice in the next verse, it's kind of odd we have this. Again, remember, we're, we're dealing with uh, Hebrew parallelism or poetry. But oftentimes it's not uncommon to add to the... Remember we talked about parallelism as the kind of that way of relating uh, the logical connections of ideas. Remember, talked about parallelism, and that's the way that the prophets would write down their messages and communicate. They'd also use powerful images and memorable images, things that people would walk away from and say, oh, yeah, I remember he talked about a lion. Oh, that was a reference to the Assyrians, you know. And that's the way our, our songs and our poetry works. Sometimes poets or songwriters will build and paint in a picture that sticks in your mind, right? That's the way it works. That's no different then. Notice what happens in verse 11. Where is the den of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, lioness, and the lion's cups prowled with nothing to disturb them? The lion tore enough for his cubs. He killed enough for his lionesses. And he filled his lyres with prey and his dens with torn flesh. He 
Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I'll burn up her chariots in smoke. A sword will devour your young lions. I'll cut off your prey from the land, and no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. So the lions might be a reference to kind of like the whole army, maybe the maybe the, the, the generals who are overseeing the army. It might be a series of the the head lion and then the lionesses and you know the kind of the kind of the what am I looking for here? The the authority structure of the of the Assyrian armies. There's no safe place now for them to be according to uh, to Nahum. Um, so we move to chapter three and we're almost finished with the book of Nahum. It's just three chapters, but uh, it's kind of a interesting chapter. And and this is uh, beginning in chapter three, verse one. Let's see. Uh, Boyd, could you read for us in chapter three, verses one through three? Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, the, the cracks of the whip, the chatter of the wheels, the gallop of the horses, the, the jolts of chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords, and glittering spears, many casualties, piles, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumble over the portraits. That's graphic, isn't it? That's real life. Um, and that's the that's the horrors of this kind of battle that's fought. I mean, if you're involved in a siege, you don't want to be trampled over like this by the charging army. You don't want your walls to cave in, um, nor do you want to be starved out or diseased out. Basically, if you lose your clean water source and you're on the inside of the walls, I mean, this is horrific. Um, this is the kind of thing that. Judah, if they're hearing this, they may be scratching their head saying, this happened to us? If we're, you know. And, and what the, the point that uh, Nahum is making here in the very first verse, he gives a woe. Woe to the blood, bloody city. Really, it's strong Hebrew, bloodthirsty city. Um, and I throw this picture up just to kind of capture the idea that not unlike the Roman Empire that's going to come later in history. You know how the Roman Empire had a way of worshiping violence? You know that? And the whole Colosseums and the throwing people to the lions and all of that. It's because they, you know, violence was, was, had become so embedded in their culture. Whether it was war on the battlefield, if you see, I should have thrown up the opening scene of the, of that movie, uh, where the Roman legion takes out the German, uh, what was that called? Uh, about the one guy. It's a classic scene of the Roman legion taking on a group of German, so, uh, the, the Vikings or whatever. And it's that you know, Boyd, what I'm talking about? That one. Let me come on. It's on the tip of my tongue, but it was. It showed you, yeah, Gladiator. The opening scene of Gladiator. Yeah, that's that's actually from Gladiator. That's right. Sorry, I was confusing you. I'm glad you clarified that. Uh, but yeah, it shows you how efficient the Roman machine was in terms of how they're, they're, they fought battles and literally annihilated the, the, the opponent. But, but not unlike the Roman Empire, the Assyrians were really good at what they did. Of the three bullies on the block that we'll see as we, as we move through prophets, the Assyrians were the worst in terms of the violence that they imposed on their, their defeated opponent. They literally would take out an entire nation ceasing to exist uh, and, and export them never to be seen again as a nation. A little more friendly would be the Babylonians. At least they kept the conquered people intact, but in kind of a ghetto type situation, overseeing, and, and, and they, they become you know, inscripted as servants uh, to serve the broader community. The nicer would be the Persians. They would be the third one to come along after they defeat the, the Babylonians. And the Persians would actually let the conquered people to return back oftentimes to, you know, set up camp again and rebuild their city and their lives. So the Assyrians, though, you have to know, they were they were a culture of violence uh, at this time. You see it in the the annuals or the records of some of the kings who would write down and boast about their, 
their victories. Uh, this one comes from the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. I let dogs, swine, wolves, vultures, the birds of the heavens, and the sweetwater fish Piranhas, devour their cut off limbs. The people who lived in the city had not come out and had not acknowledged my rule I slew. I chopped off their heads and cut off their lips and attached a dog chain to him. Dot, dot, dot. Man, you can just see it. That celebration of, of violence in kind of a prideful kind of way. So these were the kinds of activities. Here's where it gets interesting for Judah. So this is where the prophet Nahum may be turning slightly away from the Assyrians, and now he's trying to get maybe a little bit of the attention of his audience, uh, those in Jerusalem and in Judah. So the second reason comes with the Assyrians mixing religion with this temple prostitution idea. And we see that in verse 4. Um, Boyd, could you uh, keep reading there in verse 4? Chapter 3, yeah. yeah. All because of the one who loves to the harlot, allure and the mistress of, in the, of the sorcerers and enslaved nations by her prostitution and people by her witchcraft. I, yeah, just pause there. So that kind of sets up now. That now the attention goes to the details. What's going on in Assyria religiously? Harlotries, um, charming, the mistress, the sorcery, Selling nations by her harlotries and families by her sorceries. That sounds kind of like an inten intense description of syncretism on steroids. They're, 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 they're pagans, but they're pagans times ten with regards to their religious practices and bringing in temple prostitutions and all of this. And, you know, how does the Lord feel about this? These are people who are, we have to, you know, remind ourselves they're, they were created in the image of God. What are they doing with that? So there's injustice. And you see in verse 5, Behold, I am against you. That is the Lord, declares the Lord of hosts. Well, how does he feel about it? Well, I'm going to get graphic in how I feel about it. I will lift up your skirts over your face and show you off to the nations. That is your nakedness. And to the kingdoms, your disgrace. I'll throw filth on you. I'll make you vile. I'll set you up as a spectacle. And it will come about that all who see you will shrink from you and say, Nineveh is devastated. Who will grieve for her? Where will I seek comforters for you? There's a disgrace there. There's no one coming to your funeral. There's no one coming to mourn for your loss. And, and you'll, you'll be humiliated before you're defeated. Kind of intense. Um, but we see that in other places. We'll see that in, in other prophets that come along. And it reminds us that the Lord has strong, there, there's, there's, the Lord is not detached, right, from the injustice that's in the world around Israel and Judah at the time. We've already seen the judgment or the oracles against nations. Prophets will spend a little time reminding their audience, hey, Usually Israel or Judah is listed at the end. We saw that with, remember, with Amos listing, oh, actually, uh, Hosea. No, that's Amos who does that. He starts by listing all of the nations around, but then his focus focuses on Israel, Judah, and then Israel. Israel's listed last. And by the way, Israel, your sins are no different than the pagan nations around. That's kind of the point that I think here is kind of implicit in Nahum's message. So if the... Lord's responding this way to the sins, this kind of idolatry, which has a link to harlotry, which we've seen before in the prophet Hosea with Israel in the north. How is the Lord going to respond to the, these kinds of sins if they're in, an, in the midst of his own people? Similar sins committed by his chosen people. That's, that's the point I think Nahum's trying to get at. You remember, uh, let's go back to uh, the kinds of sins that were prevalent during this historical time period. Um, things were not going that great in the kingdom. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 17. You want to turn there, or you can just follow along. 
in the description of why Israel fell, Judah's you know, brother to the north, you remember the theological reason for Israel's fall at the hand of the Assyrians was listed. Just a little bit of details I'll give you. Beginning in chapter 17, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 14. However, they did not listen. They stiffened their neck like their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God, and they rejected his statutes. They rejected his covenant, which he had made with their fathers, and his warnings with which he warned them, and they followed vanity. They became vain. They went after the nations which surrounded them, concerning which the Lord had commanded them not to do like them. They forsook all his commandments of the Lord their God. They made for themselves molten images, even two calves, the two calves that Jeroboam the first established, and he made and made he made an Asherah and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. Then they made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire when they worshipped Amalek, and they practiced divination, that's the sorcery, and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him. So the Lord was very angry with Israel. So there's a continuity, I think, that's established with, with Nahum. All right, well, we're almost to the end here of Nahum. So his oracle uh, is complete with Nineveh's full destruction. Again, he doesn't leave any details out. Um, Jared, keep reading there at the very end in verse uh, chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Right at the very end, chapter 3. Got it? Did I say you? I did. Jared. Okay. <laughs> Number 3, verse 18 through. 18 and 19. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There is no easing your hurt. Your wounds, your wound is grievous. All hear the news about you. Clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil. So that's uh, how it ends. Um, and like, uh, it's interesting if we think of the first prophet that was called to preach to the Ninevites. Remember his name? Jonah. He had a little prophetic uh, road trip to Nineveh, preached a message of repentance. Uh, and about 100 years has passed since then. And now we're hearing from the prophet Nahum. Now there's, you might think of a hundred years of time for those seeds to maybe germinate a bit, but they don't. Assyria continues down the road, uh, away from the Lord, away from anything that's, uh, you know. And Judah might end up like Nineveh, should she refuse to repent. Um, Judah's fate may be similar to that of uh, Nineveh in terms of an outside invader coming in and, and taking, tearing down the walls and, and taking people into exile. But this will be the message that's to come. Nahum is just greasing the skids a bit, his message. So the next prophet that we see. Did you notice what was in the foreground of that picture? Did I mess something up? No. The down flag pole. It's a little bit more to that picture than. Well, what's your, well, that's a good point. What, what point are you making? I'm um, just saying that that shows the, the, say the downfall of the kingdom. Oh. With the flagpole being laid down. Yeah, I actually added that picture just today, so that's interesting. I didn't, that's good, good point. The kingdom or the nation has fallen as the flag collapses. That's good. Well, let's transition before our break into Habakkuk, prophet Habakkuk. And that's kind of a fun picture. A few of you have emailed me uh, for a request for the whole set of all these pictures. If you've got kids at home and you like to bring your kids into what you're learning, you can show them these pictures and explain how these books kind of fit together. I, I'd be willing to send them to you if you're interested. Just email me. But Habakkuk, you see the Ha backpack. Anything else of significance? Ben, what do you think there? I'm terrible at these. Pictures. Oh, come on. They're not IQ tests. Don't, don't worry. What about what's on the... Watch, but the Watchtower. Yeah, Watchtower. That's yeah, yeah. That's gonna come out in uh, uh, chapter three, 
uh, I think there, the watchtower idea, or is it 219? It's in there. We'll get to it. But yeah, the prophet standing on his watchtower. He's the prophet who's looking and he's watching and uh, waiting to see. He's, get, he's getting a, a, an advanced gaze of what's about ready to come. And that's the, that's the difficult job that Habakkuk has as a prophet. Um, and we'll see. So this is why uh, Habakkuk is a hinge book with Nahum. If Nahum's preaching the, the downfall of the Assyrians, Habakkuk is going to pick up the pieces. Now he's going to talk about the rise of the Babylonians, the next big bully on the block for Judah. So that's what we have in terms of the hinge idea. You can keep track of that. Um, so right around the fall of Nineveh in 612 B.C., probably have the center of gravity for Habakkuk's message showing up as he's preaching on the streets of Jerusalem. So if that makes sense. Um, what's interesting, while Nahum's message really minimized any kind of judgment directed directly against Judah, um, what we're going to see is... Um, Let's see, what did I have here? Um, I think basically Habakkuk's going to get bring that message of judgment a little bit closer to home uh, with Judah. In fact, he's going to put the message of judgment against Judah pretty much front and center uh, in his book. Let's uh, pick up with that a little bit. John over here, let's uh, read uh, chapter 1 and the first four verses to get a sense of what would have gotten Habakkuk thrown in jail for preaching on the streets of Jerusalem? How far did you want me to go? Down through verse 4. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, Habakkuk's complaint. O Lord, how shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? O cry to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strike and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Okay, let's just pause there. So the law, the Torah in verse 4, my translation says, it's ignored. Um, so Habakkuk, the prophet, his eyes are opened. The Lord is giving him this oracle, and we've seen before the oracles that are received, um, they have a weight to them. They're a burden. Prophets receive these, excuse me, these oracles, and they're having to carry them around. It's kind of like that, going back to that, you know, that bottle of Coke that's shaken up. The prophets bubbling forth. The word for prophet in Hebrew means literally to bubble forth. They've, they got this burden. It's putting the pressure on them. They must speak. And Habakkuk has a difficult message. So as his eyes are open to the Violence, iniquity, wickedness, and destruction, strife, and contention of the people of God. In verses 2 and 3, we see some of those details. Um, the crime is introduced right before the people. They're at the end of verse 3. They're ignoring the Torah. They're ignoring the instruction um, of the Lord. They're walking out of their covenant obligations, right? It's like the wife comes home from work. She looks at her... Marriage certificate on the wall, and she walks out, never to be seen. She walks out of the family. She walks away from her marriage responsibilities. She's married. She has a family. She says, well, talk to the hand. The face ain't listening. I'm out of here. And that's kind of the, the attitude that Habakkuk is, is addressing here. Um, and here in chapter 2, verse 1, we'll see. There's, there's where it's the, it may be translated, uh, Ben, I will stand on my guard post. Maybe it's translated, the idea of watchtower. Um, he's on a tower and he's watching. That's the idea of the picture here. So, uh, so let's uh, see what happens next. You know, again, like uh, I like this picture. <laughs> You've ever been in a situation like this? You're the only one around that's seeing the impending doom, the impending destruction. You've got your finger and. What do you do? It's the finger in the dike. Do you see it? Yeah, he's trying to hold back the water. Um, Habakkuk is like the little Dutch boy in this idea, this 
you know, saving your country. How are you going to do this? Danger is coming. You're, at, you're on the top of your watchtower and you're seeing before it even gets there, this danger that's coming. The Babylonians are on their way. You've got to warn your people of this, of this danger. And this is kind of the, the tension and the pressure that we, that we see coming out of the book here of Habakkuk. You're the only one. You've got to do something about it. So you see there in verse 5, Habakkuk. I can picture him preaching on the streets of Jerusalem. Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder. Kind of gets your attention, doesn't it? It's preaching. Because I, the Lord, capital I, am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. And you're all standing, whoa, I just got out of all these. <laughs> you know, give me a chance here to catch up with you, uh, Habakkuk. What do you have to say now? For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that's another name for the Babylonians, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. What are you trying to say, Habakkuk? Yeah, they're coming our way. See where he's going? This is the, the warning shout that Habakkuk is given. And this, uh, you know, this kind of message preached on the streets of Jerusalem would constitute treason against the king. This would get you thrown in jail. This would get you in trouble. You're preaching against the, the king. And another thing, uh, it would have constituted heresy. Uh, those in Jerusalem would hear this and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Habakkuk, you're ready for the loony bin. In fact, that's where you're going next because the Lord is obligated to bless us and protect us. Look, look at our prosperity. Look at our our sense of security. Look at how what the Lord has done for us lately. And you're telling us that the Lord is going to operate against us. Remember, remember that when Hezekiah went out and, and remember the Sennacherib crisis, Habakkuk? The Lord had our back then. Remember, he routed the Assyrian army and sent Sennacherib home. He wrote himself, remember, Hezekiah was like a caged bird, but... Look who won. The Lord won the battle for us then. Isn't he going to do that again, Habakkuk? You're, you're a false prophet. You've got to be a false prophet, Habakkuk. You know, this is the kind of pushback you, you, you can only imagine a prophet like, with this kind of message, a prophet like Habakkuk would have received. God's obligated to protect. We're his covenant people. You know, we've, we've had a good... We had a good string of kings lately, Hezekiah and, and, and Josiah. I mean, look at what's, we've got good things happening and all of this. We all saw what he did to the Assyrians. Isn't he obligated to do that again with this new group called the Chaldeans or the Babylonians? Well, Habakkuk is going to respond with more details uh, about the nature of this bully. Uh, what will this bully be like? And he see that in uh, chapter 1, verse 6. Let's see. Anne Merritt, could you read for us? Where, is she not here tonight? Oh, she's not here. All right. Christ, Kristen, could you read for us? Where? Starting in verse 6b. Let's just read 6, six through, uh, down through 11. Chapter 1, right? Yep. Okay. For behold, I am rising up. You've got to write, read it kind of in a mean, tense. <laughs> Can't you? Yeah, I don't think you can. <laughs> okay, that's okay. You ever yell, do you have kids? Do you ever yell at them when you're mad and angry? Well, then, I'm not calling you. No, you can just read it normal. I'm just giving you a hard time. For behold, I am rising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who marched through the uh, breadth of the earth to seize dwelling not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth for themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift uh, to devour. To where? Down through verse 10. They all come from violence, all their faces forward. They, gave, uh, they gather captivity like sand. 
At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Well, there you go. There they are described, the Babylonians. Apparently, they're very good at siege warfare. You see that? At the very end, they heap up rubble to capture it. That's the idea of one of the strategies of defeating a walled city is heaping up stones and eventually having a nice highway over the top. And that took a little time. And that's why you needed that protective gear to keep your workers protected. But they have a reputation of, uh, you see their... Their, their horse, their, their cavalry is swift. Um, the horsemen in verse 8, they're feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Who do they report to? Themselves. Uh, that's not good news. Um, they fly like eagles. They come for violence. Their horde of faces move forward. If you heard this, you'd be, uh, I'm a little bit scared now, Habakkuk. Really? Are you talking about? an army that's a lot like the Assyrians coming after us soon. And you start getting a few people's attention. Um, but verse 11b, um, we see ultimately the prophet reminds us that the Babylonians, if they're starting to act like this, they too, like the Assyrians, will be held accountable for their pride and their arrogance and their brutality. Verse 11 They'll sweep through like the wind and pass on. Here's one of those big buts. But they will be held guilty. They whose strength is their God. See, there's a little bit of parallel that, to the idea of this violence, this culture of violence was actually something that was a part of their worship. They worshiped them, the, the culture of, of bloodshed and, and, and all of that. It's a, there's a little bit of similarity here. Their strength, whose strength is their God. But a little bit of a reminder in verse 11 that they'll be held accountable for that. And um, let's see. So what will, yeah, verse 12. Let's read verse 12. And art thou, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? Will we not die? Thou, O Lord, hast appointed them to judge. And thou, O Rock, hast established them to correct. It's kind of a key verse, verse 12. You see the, the idea of the assignment to the Lord of his intention to assign to the Babylonians the job of appointing them to judge, that is, as if the, the Babylonians who are coming will be, they'll be instruments of the divine judgment. And, O oh rock, what else are you doing? Well, you're establishing them then to correct. So the idea of judge or bringing judgment, also the idea of correcting. So the Babylonians are interesting. They're already identified as a tool, a divine tool of the Lord. So, this is the theology that we'll see as, as the prophets after Habakkuk start to develop this idea of the exile. You see the purpose of the exile starting to kind of merge into clarity. Do you see it? What happens when we go into exile? Well, it's a result of receiving judgment as a nation. And then what happens when we're there? This idea of correction. This idea of correction. And this is not the first time we've seen the I think I've gone back here before, but let's just remind ourselves, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Moses was the first one to lay down the theology of the exile. When, if, and when it happens to God's people, which it already did, because he refers back to the wilderness experience. Forty years in the wilderness, well, what was that all about? Moses says, well, you'll remember all the way which the Lord your God had led you in the wilderness these 40 years, verse 2 in chapter 8, that he might humble you, Tested you, that's the idea of refinement, to know it was in your heart, whether it would be whether you'd keep his commandments or not. Well, what did he was he really about doing that? Moses says, Yeah, he humbled you and he let you be hungry, but he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, so that he might make you understand what's the lesson that man shouldn't just live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. What else? Moses, well, your clothing didn't wear out on you those 40 years, nor did your feet swell 
those 40 years. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you. There's the connection to the idea of correction, right? Disciplining you or correcting you, just as a, I prefer the translation, a father disciplines his son. This is good parenting. We've talked about this before. So this is the idea that we see at kind of the rudimentary stage in Habakkuk's theology. Really, would the Lord allow an opposing nation to come in, destroy our city, and exile us? It seems to be, well, yeah. If, if you don't turn and repent and respond to the Lord in the right way, an exilic experience may just be what the doctor order what the doctor orders for the situation. All right, well, let's take our first break. We'll come back here and finish Habakkuk and get into Zephaniah and probably be done a little early tonight. So let's just take a 10-minute break and uh, 